Hey, Brandon, I think I have a good name for our podcast. You really do? I really do. Wow. I'm going to call it Conversations in a Meat Locker. Okay. Oh, because my basement it is, is so cold. cold in your basement. Yeah. I'd... I brought an extra jacket today and I might end up putting it on. This is the actual basement at my office. I don't know why it's kept cold. I guess this is just Kara's call. There's no uh, HVAC down here. Oh, is There's that no what it vents. is? Yeah. So this isn't mm. air conditioned or uh, heated. It's just this is how it naturally is. <laughs> eight feet below ground in American Fork, Utah in May, I guess. I guess. Okay. Conversations in a meat locker. So a couple weeks ago, maybe maybe a couple of months ago at this point, Adam <laughs> printed off, producer Adam, a list of heist movies for us because he's like, you guys like heists and you said, Man, you want to talk about them? Heists are like my favorite thing. They are. I love them my as a genre. As well. My favorite subgenre, like multiple books that I've written are heists. Mm -hmm. Every time I go to a book, I'm like, all right, how can I write something that's fun that's not a heist this time? <laughs> So we thought we would talk about our favorite heist movies, and Adam kindly got us two lists of heist movies. One was from Metacritic. What was the other one from, Adam? Just um, Rotten Tomatoes? Yeah. Yes. It's like Rotten Tomatoes' top heist movies and Metacritic's top heist movies. Are either of these lists in order? I think they both they are in both order. They both are in order, yes. Okay, with the low numbers are the most highly rated ones? Yes. So here's what's going to happen, though. That is bananas. Though. These are both... Movies that someone, their curated lists made by either Rotten Tomatoes oh, or Metacritic, okay. where they said, we're applying the tag heist to this, and then it ranked them based on their Metacritic or tomato score, not by how good a heist they are. Not how good are. of a heist they are, just by their goofy little algorithm of yes. a bunch of people rated this highly. Which Adam thought we would have problems with and yeah. argue about. <laughs> He's well, always... Baby Driver's number one on both lists, yes. which is a crime against art. But I actually haven't seen Baby Driver. You and Adam were talking about it before, but I kind of have been planning to see it. But then you were grousing about it. So I'm like, maybe I won't. It's because I'm a big sticky stick in the mud. I know a lot of people love it and is clearly beloved. It's number one on both of these lists. First of all, it's not a heist by any stretch of that <laughs> definition. And we should probably no, no, no. Heists come up are, with a definition. Heists are going on. While he's sitting and waiting for the heist to end. There are heists. In no, they're not heists. They're just like bank robberies. Okay. Which I feel like you can't really say that. Okay. Like if it was literally a movie about the guy who sits outside of mm -hmm. Nakatomi Plaza for seven hours while people go inside and go through this elaborate shenanigan to get money out of the vault. Right. I would watch that movie. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's a legit argument right there. Like, I mean, I hadn't even noticed that, but... Die Hard is not on these lists, right? No, it's not. Is Die Hard a heist? Well, like you said, there's a heist going on in it. Right. But it's not about the people doing the heist, and so maybe that's why it is not considered yeah, a heist Yeah, I movie. wouldn't consider Die Hard a heist, as I think about it, because of that idea, right? Mm -hmm. Die Hard started its own genre. Yeah. What did they call that genre? They used to just call it Die Hard call or something. action movie. No, no, no. <laughs> they call it... Oh, under yeah. siege movies or something like that. Like big person trapped in a location with bad guys has to stop them. Yes. There's a term for it now. It used to just be die hard on a boat or die hard yeah. on Air Force One or whatnot. But I would agree that you can't put die hard on this list for that reason. But for the same argument, like you can't put Baby Driver on the list. And <laughs> you're right. It's not a heist. It's a stick up. Though... It blurs the lines. Is it a heist that what Joker pulls at the beginning of Dark Knight? Well, I guess it depends, right? Mm -hmm. it, I wouldn't say that it's a heist. For me, since I guess we're getting into the weeds of heists here, a heist story means that we are specifically spending all of our time focusing on a bunch of people who come together with a specialty to steal something from a location in a very complicated way. Okay. I am on board with that description. That description folds Ocean's Eleven. Yep. And Mistborn and all of these different things kind of under one umbrella. Yes. Inception counts. Mm -hmm. And Ocean's Eleven obviously counts. Italian Job counts. Those are kind of the two pillars that I usually use to explain heist movies, yeah. are those two. But you made the argument beforehand that The Sting does not, which was the quintessential heist movie in a lot of people's minds. 
Why does The Sting well, not count? Well, see, for me, The Sting, which is a fantastic movie. Let's yes. not... I don't want angry letters. I'm going to get them anyway because I think Baby Driver's dumb, but... <laughs> The Sting is a phenomenal and perhaps the phenomenal con movie. Mm -hmm. But I see a con as different than a heist. Heists can include cons. Right. There's usually a character in the heist whose job is to pull cons while the heist is Mm -hmm. going on. Uh, That's Sophie from Leverage. She's the Mm -hmm. con artist. That's her whole job is to go in and trick people into whatever. And so Sting, they're not breaking into a location and taking something out of it, which for me... Makes it not a heist. Okay. I can I can see this argument, right? Like, I wouldn't argue that Dirty Rotten Scandals is a heist, even though they are trying to rob mm-hmm. somebody because they're trying to con someone. They're trying to rob somebody, but yeah. there's not the necessarily the elaborate break-in, break-out. It's all about performing and lying and tricking someone into giving you their money. Yes. Which is very different. Okay, okay. Then, by multiple definitions... Baby Driver is not a heist. By whoever made these list definitions, it is. Yeah, so whoever made these lists is like, Baby Driver is awesome. And Baby Driver, to its credit, has, I would say, one and a half really phenomenal car chases. It's a car chase movie. It's not a heist movie. And, you know, we could do an entire episode on car chase movies, Oh yeah, frankly, which would be really fun. But Baby Driver would show up in that one. Here's my thing, and the last I should probably say about Baby Driver, because... I can just feel the internet just glowing red with rage right now that I don't like it. What's his name? Edgar Wright, who directed it. He did, several years prior, a short with Noel Fielding as the getaway driver for a bank robbery. And it's like four or five minutes long, and it's just him in the car waiting for people to come out, and he dances to the music. It is... All by itself, brilliant, and ten times more entertaining than Baby Driver. (laughs) Okay. You heard it here first. The podcast that will in the future be named Dan and Brandon Make People Angry on the Internet. (laughs) What's your number three heist film? Oh, my, okay. My number three. Did you number them, or? I kind of put stars on them. Oh, you starred them? Let's see here. My number three is Ocean's Eleven. Ocean's Eleven. Yep. The new one, not the new, new one. The George Clooney, Ocean's Eleven. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have seen a lot of heist films, and I thought The Sting was a heist, but I didn't put it on this list. It would be probably my number four. I really like The Sting, but Ocean's Eleven just captivated me in the perfect way, and it did everything right in making a, a heist movie for me. Mm -hmm. so it juggled a large cast of characters i really like how a good heist does that it's one of these things that as a writer i like seeing people pull things off i like seeing people do difficult things it's why infinity war is one of my favorite movies narrative difficulty not the characters right Mm. and it's narratively very difficult what they did with oceans 11 to Make all those characters memorable. I can still remember them all, right? Can you remember all their names? No. You don't need to remember their names, I actually though. can't remember anyone's name except for Danny Ocean. Oh, like, yeah? I can't even remember. The Mormon Brad twins. Pitt. I remember the Mormon twins, but yeah. I don't remember their names. Right. Oh, wait. Matt Damon's character's name is Linus. Yes. Okay. I remember that. Mm. So I think looking through the ones that I've starred, I'm going to put Ocean's Eleven at number three as well. Okay. And I want to give a special shout out, however, to Ocean's Twelve, mm-hmm. which is not even half as good of a movie, in my opinion, but has one of my all-time favorite sequences in any movie, which is Julia Roberts playing a character who looks like Julia Roberts but isn't and tries to convince Bruce Willis playing himself that she really is Julia Roberts and he doesn't believe her because she doesn't look enough like Julia Roberts. That's audaciously brilliant. Yeah, and it it is a wonderful scene. Um... (laughs) Uh, agreed agreed on that one all right all right so we both have the same number three What's yeah well your... okay and so okay. i need to okay. say the reason that it's number three mm. is because i think by the definitions we've just created mm-hmm. i don't think i can count jackie brown as a heist oh okay and it's on this list mm-hmm. and it would absolutely be my number one it's okay. arguably my favorite crime movie ever but it really is more of just a crime movie maybe a con movie okay 
not really a heist. Yeah, I mean, I've got a bunch of honorable mentions. Yeah, I don't I know if I have any in here that <laughs> wouldn't count as heists, right? I guess the sting we've already discussed mm -hmm. doesn't quite count as a heist. Does on this list Rogue One count as a heist? I think Rogue One is a heist. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the movie itself is two, maybe three heists strung together, but that's okay because a lot of these heist yeah. movies are that. I mean, that's the classic example in The Italian Job is, here's a heist that goes wrong, we just see the end of it, mm -hmm. and now we're going to do the heist again, except on the person who wronged us, right? Yeah. That's like a quintessential heist archetype. And so, you know... When I saw them list, I'm like, no way. But as I think about it, all right, Rogue One has, let's collect a bunch of specialists. Mm -hmm. The specialists don't really have anything to do in the climax <laughs> for the most part, which is part of my problem with Rogue exactly. One. Exactly. Everyone loves Rogue Everyone One. Everyone friggin' loves it. And, and I, it's because it's dark and people think that counts as meaning. I grudgingly admit it is one of the better new era Star Wars movies, but that's only because all of them are so bad. Well, and you know what? The internet that was busily sharpening their stakes for me yes is now writing your name on all their bullets so. yeah i really don't like rogue one i walked out of rogue one confused and a little sick i like the idea of rogue one i'm not one of those is like oh you shouldn't have put this movie in here mm -hmm. i think it's a it's a great concept i just think that they had no idea what they were doing the plot is nonsensical but it is a heist you are yeah, right it is a heist the final sequence of it is a reverse heist where instead of taking something out of a location they have to put it in which is basically what inception is doing is as it? well yeah because they Aren't have they to go stealing the death star plans i thought they were broadcasting the death star plans no they have out to... into something well i mean they Isn't have that to what steal they're doing them. no the whole thing is yeah. they have to sneak in if you remember they have to like sneak into the place the cool robot gets killed they have to like move down this big archive of i don't know what they are yeah, but mini then, discs. then they have to i thought the very final bit was they do have we to have do that. to like beam it out it. But that's always something of a heist. Okay. Like, yeah, Ocean's you're right, Eleven you're has right. to get out with the money, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it really is. It's just that if it had been set up as a heist from the get-go and the plot arc was completely heist, I think that movie would make a lot more sense. Yeah. Well, and I do think that somewhere in the writing room, mm -hmm. they wanted it to be that because, like you say, a significant portion of the movie is assembling the heist crew. And we get the heist crew and yep. we know what all their specialties are. And yep. then they don't actually use them for anything. It's right. like, we have all 11 of Ocean's buddies, but we're only going to use three of them, and they all have the same power. Yes. Wow, what a succinct way to put that. <laughs> you know, I've heard that Rogue One had these problems in editing with maybe reshoots and stuff, and I see this because the big speech at the end that she makes about we need to go fight for something feels mm -hmm. like one person wanted this movie to just be Star Wars again, right? Yeah. And they're like, all right, we need like a big inspiring speech. We're making the Dirty Dozen, but with Star Wars. So we need all these bad guys to decide to be good guys. Except two of those bad guys are Jedi Temple guards who have shown nothing but honor for the entire thing. While another person was someone that their own team tortured and nearly killed, who is suddenly just friendly with all of them. And the other one is a girl who was in it to save her father and then just watched the rebellion kill her father. So, yeah. you know, that whole scene. Yeah, just, it's... But if you pull that part out, like it feels like someone added that in to be like, we need to have a big inspirational Star Wars moment mm. in the middle of this heist thing. Then maybe, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. We, we could talk about Rogue One forever. Let's not. It's People not. are tired okay. of me ranting so about Star I, Wars. I actually do want to continue... Is this a heist or not discussion? Because okay. I find it fascinating. But first, mm -hmm. I want to take a wild digression into current events. Okay. Because while heists are one of my very favorite genres of storytelling, my favorite genre of news article is the food heist. <laughs> we talked about this. I had no idea that such a thing existed. Food heists are amazing. There are several foods, such as, for example, Parmesan cheese and maple syrup, mm -hmm. that are, if you get the good stuff, far more valuable by weight than gold. Okay. And so there are people who go through crazy elaborate things, and someday we need to talk about the great Canadian maple syrup heist. But... Yes, you mentioned that last time, I believe. I did. Mm -hmm. And I will leave it as our uh, 
enticing white whale that we will one day talk about. Today, I want to talk about the brand new story, which isn't really a heist, but it's food theft, and it delights me. There was a college student in China who found a discrepancy on the Kentucky Fried Chicken website versus the app. Okay. And what this basically boiled down to is if you got a coupon for free food on one of the two platforms and you redeemed it on the other platform, you could get your food without losing the coupon. And so he and a couple of his buddies ended up getting $21,000 worth of free fried chicken before they were finally caught. This is not where I thought this was going. <laughs> Uh, where was this? This was in China. Uh-huh. And I don't remember where in China. Okay. But yeah, I was a college student. And the reason this is in the news now is because his trial just ended and he was sentenced to two years in prison, which is the sad, you know, end of the story. But $21,000 worth of free fried chicken. See, that seems like it should be a wrong burgundy moment for everyone involved, <laughs> where they're like, I'm not even mad. I'm impressed. Good yeah. job. Yeah. You like, got free food. Hey. This is probably $21,000 worth of advertising. Actually, more like 10000 because it's not like they, you know, mm -hmm. when this thing breaks and they fix the loophole, but it's China, so that doesn't happen. Now, uh, if they turned it into a media opportunity, mm -hmm. they fix the hole and then they're like, hey, get our app and you might get some free chicken. And then everyone did it like that would be fun. I but... think that might be false advertising. Well, <laughs> I think you get in trouble for that one. I don't know if it's false advertising to say there is the possibility of stealing from us. Because that <laughs> that's true. <laughs> we do not condone this, but the game is afoot. Anyway, I'm glad that you are not in charge of KFC's <laughs> marketing team. Or actually, I'm sad. Anybody's I'm sad. art market. I'm not even in charge of my own marketing, which is <laughs> why I'm poor. Anyway, I have a Google alert set up for food heists, and that's what it gave me. So I wanted to you let you know. You actually texted me when this happened. Yeah. So excited. I had no idea what you were even talking about. It took me a few minutes to remember. <laughs> You're like, there's been a food heist. Food heist. Mm -hmm. And Brandon's like, why did I give him my phone number? All right, so back to our list. Mm. I want to ask about fish called Wanda. Okay. Is that a heist? Yeah, yeah. Is it? Kind of. I mean, there is a heist. They are trying to steal yes. something from a location and yes. get out with it. Yeah. Uh, it's different <laughs> in that it, I mean, there's a team, uh -huh. but they're all working against each other. Okay, yeah. Rather than together with point. specialties. That's a very good point. There is a classic archetype that is the team of specialists all try to do something mm -hmm. against one another, right? And normally yeah. it's been like in the cannonball run sort of genre where it's like, we're all going to race to this place and try to mess each other up. Wacky races. <laughs> but <laughs> see, now that you describe it that way, the Michael Crichton version uh -huh. or the Fish Called Wanda version of a Michael Crichton book. Okay. Where you get all the different scientists together mm -hmm. to explore and analyze the weird alien or whatever it is. Yeah. The Andromeda effect except a farce and they're all trying to screw each other over. Yeah. And end up destroying the world oh. in the process. Uh, do they always have to destroy the world? Does well, this, I mean, this is where you go. If it was Sphere or Andromeda yes. Strain, like, yes, that's how it would end. No, the whole point, spoilers for Andromeda Strain, is <laughs> that nothing they did mattered in Andromeda Strain. That's the whole point. Oh, right? man, you're right. Uh, <laughs> so. Which would make it even better as a farce. Okay, well, now I know what I want to write next. That's a pretty good idea. I want to talk about that, though. Michael Crichton. Okay. So he has one true heist. Great Train Robbery. Yes. Which, which I is think excellent. is on this list somewhere. Is it a movie? I've There's never seen. There's one called The First Great Train Robbery. Okay. But I don't know if it's... If it's a Michael Crichton. I mean, Holy there was crap. that... I've never even seen it, but it has Donald Sutherland and Sean Connery in it. What year was it? 1979. Okay. That's before Crichton managed to really break into Hollywood. Yeah. So I wonder if we have to watch that movie now, but... Well, what's it? Rotten Tomatoes. It's on that thing. It's Rotten Tomatoes score is 78. Okay. We got to watch that nothing movie. to sneeze at. Yeah. But Michael Crichton, for those who don't know kind of Michael Crichton's story, and I'm paraphrasing here, he wanted to make movies. 
He wanted mm-hmm. to be a producer. He was having no luck, so he started writing novels. The novels took off, and then he was able to backdoor into being a television and movie producer, most famous probably for ER as in his producing work. You know, he did write Jurassic Park, which is his most yeah. famous book. And every one of his stories has an aspect of this heist to it. Only the Great Train Robbery is actually a heist, mm-hmm. but they are all about let's gather a team of specialists. He loves his teams of specialists. Yes. And let's do wacky stuff with them, such as investigate an alien artifact and potentially all go insane and rewrite the nature of the world. It's a you weird know, book. One of the very first cons you and I went to, in fact, I think mm-hmm. it might have been Montreal where we met our future editor. I remember being in a panel with some cantankerous old dudes. Uh-huh. And I want to say that this was Gene Wolfe, but I might just be conflating all cantankerous old SF dudes into him. So anyway. they all become Jerry Pornell to me. <laughs> you know, it might have been him too, because I can't actually remember which one is which. But mm-hmm. anyway, the point is, someone was asking about really high profile science fiction authors who have mainstream respect. And then he immediately stopped and said, and I'm not talking about people like Michael Crichton, for whom science fiction is just where they go slumming every now and then. Except for the fact that every Michael Crichton... Okay, not everyone, because Great Train Robbery is Mm -hmm. not... Is not science fiction. And Rising Sun is not... Is that the name of it? His Japan... His Japan one, Rising Sun. Yeah. Yeah, is not. But... The vast majority of them are science fiction. Yeah. He, he doesn't slum and didn't slum. He's passed away, I know. unfortunately, in science well, fiction. He and popularized that's it. That's why this was so funny to me, mm-hmm. is like he was complaining about why doesn't science fiction have mainstream respect, and then immediately points to the one guy with a ton of mainstream respect and says, well, he doesn't count because of all the mainstream respect he has. <laughs> yeah. That might be the same con. It was one of those cons that... I heard referenced a couple of times the name that damn Scottish woman. <laughs> and I was trying that, to that figure out lines up, yeah. who it was, and it was J.K. Rowling. <laughs> and it was kind of the oh, same thing. Man. There is not as big of a sense of little brother slash envy problem at these cons as we're making same sound from these two stories. But I was like, when I found out, I'm like, oh, come on. Yeah. Just because she's suddenly popular, you're mad that she's not, you know. It's because she's not part of the club. Yes. And if you don't play in the clubhouse. Right. But you are successful at the thing the clubhouse is trying to do, then the clubhouse gets mad at you. Yep. Which is dumb. Whatever. Okay. There's another one on here. Let's go back to our opinions. Let's go back to our. (laughs) Okay. Tell me what your second one is. My second one is Inception. For all the fact that I forgot it in our discussion of (laughs) Nolan movies, somehow, I love Inception. I love heist movies. I love Nolan. And so I love Inception. Nice. And it's probably a better movie than my number one, but I have nostalgic fondness for number one, which is why it's at number one. I bet we have the same number one. And also, I bet that I like it more than you do. (laughs) Okay. I think it's awesome for reasons other than nostalgic fun. I mean, it's still awesome, for, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah, so Inception, for some reason I marked it on my thing as, this is not really a heist. It's totally a heist. Yeah. Oh, no, I forgot what my little... I have like four or five icons that I used. You designed a new I invented system. some iconography as I went through this list, and if I put a circle on it, that means it's a heist, but it's not one of my favorite heists. So that's okay. what that's on there for. So why I love Inception is, if you can't tell from my discussion of Crichton, I love people taking a formula and doing something completely new with it, right? Mm-hmm. And so the idea of Inception being, number one, putting something in a place instead of stealing it as a heist is really cool. And then, of course, the fact that it's memory-based and has all these goofy visuals and Nolan time distortion stuff and potentially non-linear narrative things happening, that all together is just a sweet, sweet package for making one of my favorite movies ever. Yeah, it's really good. And, I mean, really, it has to be the reverse heist once you're dealing with memory. Because if it's extracting a memory, that's just asking somebody something right you can't turn that into two hours of time travel shenanigans i actually wrote a story that i never released mostly because it turned out to be bad partially because it was a little too on the nose so if you haven't seen inception 
there is a part where a character pretends to be a defender of a person's memory. So mm -hmm. you can be trained to defend against people heisting your memories in your mind. And you will, in this mythology or this science fiction, you will create in your brain defenders, protectors who are in there who will attack and kill people who go in who try to steal your memories. Yeah. That idea is just a throwaway idea in Inception. There for just one scene so that Leonardo, um, Leonardo can pretend to be one of these yeah. for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I want to know that guy's story. I want to know the implanted memory that thinks it's self-aware who is there protecting you. And I wrote a whole story about this thing that was inside of someone's brain yeah. trying to prevent assault upon the brain. And That's a cool yeah. idea because mm -hmm. basically what that is is you're training yourself with like Dune Mentat style yep. whatever – in order to create an imaginary friend. Right. And it's from and the imaginary awesome. friend's viewpoint, the story is. And that part was really fun, where he took on the kind of shape of like the shadow or the green hornet or something. This okay. show that you the person- You didn't go with Bing Bong from Inside I Out? did not go with Bing Bong. Oh, okay. But he No knew wonder it was bad. <laughs> that he was not real, that he was a construct of the brain, mm -hmm. a piece of this person's personality turned into this self-aware thing that pretended to be self-aware so that it could defend secrets and memories and stuff like that. But That's awesome. Again, See, bad ending. I couldn't end it. I couldn't figure out what the secret is that he was trying to protect in a way that would be interesting. Now, because we talked about this as imaginary friends, mm -hmm. the way that I want to do it now mm. is to say that part of this training in order to create this extra personality is that they have to actually go into your childhood and find your actual kind of latent imaginary friend that you had oh. and then build that up because that gives you the foundation required to create an autonomous consciousness. If I ever do a collection of my non-Cosmere stories, I'll probably put it in with a little disclaimer of, I know this ending's bad, but there would be actually legit good stories in that a couple of hugo nominees and things so i wouldn't feel bad having one that just never quite you don't worked. want to put out a collection of all my bad stories all my bad stories by brandon sanders the podcast all my bad stories all my bad thank you welcome to another episode of all our bad stories in which we indulge the worst tendencies of our artistic sensibility have you ever seen Logan Lucky? I have not seen Logan Lucky. Yet. So Logan Lucky is Channing Tatum and Adam Driver okay. as like redneck Kentucky good old boy Hicks mm -hmm. who want to steal a bunch of money from NASCAR arena because all the money that gets taken in okay. on the betting gets sent through this pneumatic air tube system. And he was part of the construction team that worked on it and he knows how to reroute it so that they can get all the money and get away pneumatic air tubes already have my interest well there you go so basically yeah they uh construct like a vacuum thing they get daniel craig okay also doing a super like backwoods regneck accent and it's delightful i've seen clips of him doing that yeah, yeah. and the what whole a thing terrible name for this movie <laughs> Right? Like, it, am I wrong? It's so much better than everything about it led me to believe that it would be. And that's probably my own prejudices, but I don't think their ad campaign for it was very good. Why uh, do you they, name they that have, film Logan Lucky? I assume one of them is named Logan. Okay. Maybe they were trying to draw on our culture's innate love of that one Dane Cook movie. Find out what that Dane Cook movie is. Good luck, Chuck. I, good, good luck, luck Chuck. Okay. okay. So. There you go. So, yeah, also, there's one scene in Logan Lucky. I can't even remember why at this point there is a prison riot and the prisoners are holding some cops hostage and they're demanding things. And one of their demands is they want the final book in the Game of Thrones series. You're kidding me. And the cops are like, he hasn't finished it. And they're like, what do you mean? I read those books before I was arrested. I've been in here for 20 years. How has he not finished the series? And it is so great. It's hilarious. Oh, wow. Talk about a deep cut. <laughs> nice. I really want to see this movie now. It's worth seeing. Okay. It's not going to be in my top three heists, but my, my, my number two heist is actually Bob LaFlambeur, which is 1956. Uh -huh. 
arguably the first heist movie ever. Okay. It's this uh, black and white French movie and just really delightful. Right off the bat, it has all of the things. It checks all the boxes. It has the team of specialists. It has an incredibly long, very detailed, completely silent break-in theft sequence. Oh, that's nifty. Uh, you know, there's the... I haven't seen it, so... Yeah, well, mm -hmm. it's very good. I love Bob Le Flambeur. I love a lot of the old kind of French New Wave ones like Rafifi and Top Cappy that are also on this list. I did not discover good old movies until I had a roommate in college who was a film major for a while. This is Micah. And he found out and made me go through a bunch of the classics, which is, you know, how I actually ended up seeing some of the greats that didn't make the list. And so I well, will need to watch it. It's a good one. Now, I have to admit that my favorite ending of any movie ever. Okay. I cannot Ooh. remember which movie it is. Okay. It is either Top Cappy or Rafifi or Grand Slam. Okay. Those are all three heist movies of the same kind of like 1950s, early 60s era. And, you know, all three of them are about the heist and there's the whole team and they get the thing and they have all the money and they're good. And then one of them, and I cannot remember which one, so I don't consider this a spoiler. <laughs> it, it's one third of a spoiler. It ends with, you know, two of the people sitting in like a sidewalk cafe in Paris with the money discreetly mm -hmm. hidden in a bag, and they're talking about, well, we stole these jewels or this money or right. whatever the heck it was. And then Michael Caine is in the other, at the seat at a different table, and they see each other and, and nod. Christian Bale. Yeah. No, and then all of a sudden, flyers fall out of the sky, like pamphlets for something. And you think, what on earth is this? And the characters look up like, what's going on? And then a person on a motorcycle zooms by, grabs their thing, and takes off. And then the movie ends. And so they go through this entire thing to steal this with mm -hmm. all of the, you know, bank vault yep. cracking and everything. And then they lose it at the end to someone else pulling their own heist that was going on offstage the whole time. And you don't even know who it was. Oh, man, that would be even more genius if you could put the pieces together and see the other people planning the heist. That would be fun. There's a great story maybe some, but Maybe you can do that. And I just was too dumb to see it. I don't but know. But if you, we haven't, someone ought to write that thing right oh, we should all right that raises another question is okay. maverick the movie a heist maverick i'm gonna put maverick in uh the con movie category okay. rather than the heist movie right not enough specialists one person doing something yeah it has that fish called wanda-ness to yes. it where it's three people all working against each other yep four if you count alfred molina but he's mm -hmm. really only in two scenes I just remember that because, you know, the the kind of getting robbed again at the end sort of thing. I'm quite fond of Maverick. I like Maverick. Yeah, written by one of my, William Goldman, one of my favorite screenwriters. He wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which is oh, on our list. Yes, which also is not a heist. Not a heist. Is it? No. It has heists in it. Like, it's oh, good. Wait, it has bank robberies. It doesn't even have a true heist. Yeah. Right? So, I don't know. They're, they're just bank robbers. Yeah, they're just um, bank robbers. By the way, this is a good time to mention the perennial problem that we never got a third movie in that trilogy, right? Butch Cassidy, The Sting, and where's our third one? Okay. The Paul Newman, Robert Redford yeah. collabs of, yeah. you know, sassy con men. I want to see more of that. That's we a can't good now because Paul Newman passed yes. away. That is a very good point. Though, we, uh, we do live like down the road from Sundance. That's true. Mm -hmm. We should go up and talk to old Robert Redford. Be like, hey, Disney has this stuff where they can hey, resurrect people and make them act in movies from <laughs> beyond the grave. Wouldn't you love yeah. to do a movie next to a really uncanny valley version of Paul Newman? That would be amazing. Is Paul Newman dead? I think Paul I don't Newman's actually dead. know. Yes, I assume dead. he's dead. Yes. Okay. What, you just assume? I just assume he's old. <laughs> yeah, Robert Redford's old too. He's still alive. Well, yeah, but Paul Newman hasn't been in any Marvel movies, so how are we supposed to know? <laughs> Captain America 2, not a heist. Mm, yeah, Winter Soldier. Mm -hmm. No, not a heist. I not thriller. Yeah. But not a heist. Not a heist. Ant-Man is a heist. Ant-Man, the first Ant-Man is a heist. Yes, and I would put that on my honorable mentions list. I am an Ant-Man defender. Okay. I happen to love both Ant-Man films. I love them for reasons that, like, 
talking about family relationships in an interesting way, mm. right? That you have this delinquent father who is still trying to be a good father, and you have a remarried mom, and the stepdad is not a bad guy. That sort of stuff I really like. I really like yeah. that because of the way that, you know, Hank Pym's viewpoint on things reframes a lot of the heroes of the rest of the Marvel Universe as his antagonists. I think that does fun stuff. Yeah. I like that they are low key, low scale, and it allows me to enjoy one of these without having to worry about why aren't the Avengers involved, right? Yeah. Because they are not dealing with the end of the universe. They are dealing with, we need to get this thing that we want. And, you know, we're trying to save my wife, maybe. Yeah. And we are. Well, uh, and those smaller stories really kind of sell the idea that there are minor villains everywhere. Yeah. So if there's a vulture in mm -hmm. New York or a wasp or hornet or whatever, yellow jacket from Ant-Man. <laughs> yes, you got there. <laughs> I got there eventually. That, of course, the, you know, the, the Avengers don't have time to jump into all this. Yep. I do think one of the greatest strengths of the Marvel Universe in general is its willingness to tell very different kinds of stories. Yep. And to purposefully so, I think. Yes. They're like, we want this to be a spy thriller in like an old 70s style. Mm -hmm. And this one, we want it to be a kind of goofy heist movie. Yep. And this one, we want to be something totally different. They just cannot land epic fantasy um, <laughs> to the point that they just had to give up on epic fantasy. But yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, which is sad, but I, yes, epic I, fantasy is hard. It is hard in film form, right? Mm hmm. Which is why there hasn't been enough of it. Okay. Speaking of big franchises, uh -huh. let's talk about Mission Impossible. Okay. Because I think the first Mission Impossible movie is inarguably a heist. It is. It is the worst Mission Impossible, the film. Well, okay. Two is really bad, Two but I love it. Two is the worst one. Two is the worst one. But, but I prefer it over one if I have to watch them again, just because I want really? to laugh at, what's his name? The director, his doves <laughs> and Wu. fire, John Woo stuff. Every time it comes on, I'm amused. It's like fun in a <laughs> B-movie sort of way. So here was my problem with Mission Impossible, the first one. Okay. I really liked the show. I was on board for a Mission okay. Impossible. And instead, one is a heist, but it's also espionage thriller. It wants to be James Bond. So instead of a Mission Impossible team, I got Captain America 2, right? The yeah. rogue agent who has to go against when the whole team gets killed and get revenge, kind of, mm. and root out yeah. the enemy within. It's a James Bond movie. It is. And it established that the Mission Impossible films are going to be James Bond movies with heist elements rather than heist movies with some spy elements. Mm-hmm. Which I, I think is a totally fair criticism. Yes. I genuinely love the first one, mm -hmm. and I think it had some really incredible sequences in it. Yes, but, it has but some I do awesome think sequences. that Mission Impossible, with the exception of number two, is the only film franchise I can think of where every movie gets better. Yes. Wow, I'm surprised you agree with that. I thought I was the only person who thought that. Oh no, I kind of assume everyone thinks that because I think that they get inarguably better as they go along. I think the last three of the trilogy that they've done are just excellent. Mm -hmm. The JJ ones, essentially. Yeah. Right? Because you have one and two and then you have the Brad Bird one. Or maybe it's the JJ one and then the Brad Bird one. Yeah. He, JJ did three. Right. That then which he took kind of over saved it. Production of them all, right? Yeah. Bad Robot's been the maker mm -hmm. of all of these since. Yeah. Brad Bird did Ghost Protocol. Okay. Which I love. It's a good movie. Mm -hmm. I love it. I really wish Paula Patton had stuck around as part of the team. Okay, so there's really like four that are kind of in their own thing because it's, mm -hmm. you know, three, four, five, and six, right? Because seven is getting filmed yeah, right seven, now. Yeah, because seven, I think it's filmed and is coming yeah. out. But I watched in quick succession. I hadn't seen five or six, and so we watched both of those, my wife and I. And I just love the continuity things they're doing, even from the earlier ones, mm -hmm. like where his wife shows up again. Bring back the wife. And it's like, she's not been fridged. She's just smart and does not want to be involved <laughs> with this guy whose life is, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. And he has a new romantic interest, which matches him pretty well. And yeah. Rebecca Ferguson back is great. Yeah. I'm sad to lose Paula Patton. Yes. Rebecca Ferguson is amazing. You get kind of a team through these i mean it's a small team it's like three people but well, there, there's usually about four we have yeah. benji it turns into like a right. benji and uh ethan hunt yeah buddy comedy and then usually they have they, they started using luther yeah, yeah. A and lot then more. they have like the defense against the dark arts professor the other person who's going to be <laughs> on their team that is totally not evil 
right? <laughs> oh man, that mm-hmm. yes, yeah, that's what they do. Yeah, but I love them all. Yeah, but only the first one is a heist. It it is yes. on my honorable mentions because I think it's really great. There's a lot of cons and there's a lot of mini heists involved in them, mm. but for a franchise that should be the main heist franchise, there aren't a lot of heists. It is spy thriller. It is espionage thriller with some heist elements. Yeah, so like Rogue Nation mm-hmm. has yeah. the, we need to sneak into the crazy underwater vault. Yes. Which is the most obscenely ridiculous vault I've ever seen yep. devised for anything. They have to no one themselves. would ever use that mm-hmm. under any circumstances. But it's a wonderful sequence, and it all yes. works, and it's a really great stealing a thing kind of scene. Well, here's another thing they do really well for, for those who are interested in narrative and things like this. Why I think these films work so well for me mm-hmm. is because Ethan Hunt never feels like a superhero. He always feels like an underdog with some superpowers, right? They managed to make him like yeah. Indiana Jones. He is getting beat up. He is tired. He is... Feeling kind of like, what what have I gotten myself into this time? He is at the mercy of other people's in the team's ability to do their jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, he is still a superhero, right? But yeah. he is the superhero who gets the snot beat out of him in every episode, and you can still empathize with him. Well, and basically, he learned the Jackie Chan lesson. Yes. Which is, every part of your story will work better if we see you get hit in the face sometimes. Which is part of the problem with two. In two, that's yeah. not the case. In mm-hmm. two, he is just straight up superhero. He is yeah. James Bond. Well, with, and James you know. Bond never really, you know, he doesn't have that kind of self-effacing. Yep. I'm gonna lose this fight. You know, he never re- sighs resignedly. Yes. Yeah, he might brood glumly if he's being played by Daniel Craig, but <laughs> yes. And so, anyway, I would agree with you. One of my favorite film series. In that none of them are my favorite movies ever, Mm -hmm. but it is so consistently good that it's remarkable. And each one better than the last. I'm so excited for Seven to come out. Before we move off this onto our number one, what percentage of your enjoyment of those films is dedicated to knowing that Tom Cruise is like insane and doing all these weird things himself, right? That he's like actually climbing the Burj Khalifa and stuff like that. You know, that's fun to think about. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely the kind of thing that while I'm showing them to my children on Netflix, I'll say, hey, so, you know, that's actually Tom Cruise strapped to the side of that airplane. But what keeps me coming back is Mm -hmm. the stories and the characters. There are very few pure action franchises that spends as much time on making the characters likable, in my opinion. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's what I think makes it really work for me. Okay. So our number one is obviously Spongebob Squarepants movie number two, where they have to go and get back the recipe for the Krabby Patties from the pirate who stole them. Was that not your number one? That is not my number one. That's not your number one either. No, it's not. I can tell you without even looking at your list that your number one is Sneakers. Yes, it is. Because Sneakers is the best one on this list. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's pure nostalgia that makes me say that. It is a really solid movie. With the great only characters. thing I would be my number two without nostalgia, I think. Okay. The only thing that I was saying was that it doesn't beat Inception, which I think does more interesting things with the medium, because I'm all about do interesting things with the medium. Okay. Except for the fact that I just love sneakers. I do <laughs> like to laugh when I watch a movie, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be a comedy. Inception, not a lot of laughs. Mm-hmm. Inception is not about laughing yeah. nolan movies in general are not about laughing they're about other things and mm-hmm. sneakers has that perfect blend of getting it funny but also really interesting yeah. characters and you care and underdog status well, and, and, and it's able to do all of those at the same time mm-hmm. arguably the best scene in sneakers is after they've successfully stolen the box right and they're having a party, and it is hilarious. And then Whistler starts, you know, let's see what this thing is, and figures out what they stole, yeah. and it turns instantly yep. from hilarity to spooky to downright terrifying without ever telling you why is this terrifying. You can just see it on their faces. You can sense it from what's going on. Like, oh, no, we have 
stepped in it now. Right. Oh, that is a brilliant scene. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, just from the get-go, how they introduce the characters mm-hmm. and they're pulling this heist and you see them like hit their knees against like something as they're trying to like cross one of them. It's yeah, like, Robert, Redford Robert Redford tries to jump yeah. over the thing. And you're like, oh, oh, I get it. They are good at what they're doing, but they're people. Yeah. And, you know, they Well, and it's mistakes. not just that he trips over yeah. it. It's that uh, River Phoenix is the young, like, 20-year-old kid. He yeah. jumped over it, no problem. Yes. And so it's about lost youth. Right. Well, which it's becomes a, a major theme of the story yeah. later on. To the sting and things like that, right? At the same time, because you've got Redford mm-hmm. in this role, but now he's older. And it is such a wonderful film. It is on my list of perfect movies. Any movie where you can let Dan Aykroyd play himself, and it fits, is uh, we got we got a laugh from uh, from producer Adam on that one. If you guys don't know, Dan Aykroyd's insane. He really, really is an odd duck. He is uh, a brilliant comedian who is also a working class hero, conspiracy lunatic. And all three sides of him are perfectly on display in sneakers. The one thing that I would consider a, a possibly a knock against sneakers uh-huh. is that there are elements that haven't aged as well. It is so devoutly of its time. That is true. Late Cold War and early internet. You know, there was a period there in the early 90s when every movie had somebody say, if you control information, you control the world because... Everyone was freaking out over the sudden explosion of data. And that kind of stuff gets a little heavy handed, but. See here, this is going to play into my, eventually we're going to have a podcast on kind of the nature of what makes something perfect, what makes art perfect. Mm -hmm. um, Because I don't consider those knocks against the movie because part of what makes that movie great is being a time capsule of a particular time and these things are showing us what narrative was like what people were interested in what we believed and feared at the time and because of that it's not a flaw in the movie it's not a flaw in the movie any more than the mona lisa is wearing period dress right and you go but like well (laughs) you know it's not wearing uggs so why you know why would yeah that's one of my philosophies but we can't do that this time we actually tune in next time (laughs) We probably won't even do it next time. Conversations in a meat locker. (laughs) When we talk about perfection in art. Uh, No, I think that's a good point to make. And I will grant it to you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Intentionally Blank. You can join the discussion and vote for your favorite podcast title at r slash Sanderson. Produced by Adam Horn. Sound engineering and editing by Daniel Thompson.